When the truth finally dawns, it dawns in fire. But there's one they fear. In their tongue is Uvakin, Dragonborn. November 11th, 2021 marks the 10th anniversary of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's original release date, which was famously launched on the 11th of the 11th of the 11th. Over the past decade, we've seen plenty of incredible games released that have pushed the boundaries of gaming and have arguably surpassed the bar set by Skyrim. Even when it first launched, Skyrim was a game not without flaws. It didn't have the best graphics of its time, the gameplay wasn't the most innovative, the story was hardly Oscar worthy, and yet, 10 years later, we can't seem to stop playing this game. It may be a symptom of age, but when I look back at video games that took up a lot of my time, I feel a pang of guilt that just maybe I should have been doing something more productive with my time, like learning a musical instrument or a second language. I don't get this feeling too often since I fail to see how unwinding after a long day with a video game is any different to people who like to unwind in front of the TV, but it is a feeling I get when I know I spent more than 100 hours on a game. I'm being totally sincere when I say that I genuinely don't want to know how many hours I put into Skyrim, and luckily I'll almost likely never find out. I first bought a copy when it first released and played it on my Xbox 360. I did several playthroughs with several different characters and got all the achievements. A few years later I got my first gaming PC and of course the first game I bought for that was Skyrim and I spent many more hours playing the game and exploring all the mods I'd been missing out on. In 2016 I bought the game again when the special edition was released for the Xbox One and PS4 and I played through it with several characters and got all the trophies, even the ones for the DLC expansions. Shortly after that, it was announced that mods would be available for the console editions of Skyrim, along with the infamous Creation Club mods. Now, hell will need to freeze over before I support paid mods, so I never bothered with the Creation Club, but there are loads of great free ones on the consoles that make the game almost rival the PC version, something that most games can never even dream of boasting. That's not to mention the VR port of Skyrim and the version you can play on your freaking Alexa device. As I said, I don't want to know how many hours I put into Skyrim over the past 10 years, but I wouldn't at all be surprised if it's nearing the thousand hours mark. Oh god, here comes the guilt. Every few years, Skyrim always seems to find a way to pull players back into its world. When I first began this video, I felt it was pretty safe to assume that Skyrim had no more tricks up its sleeve after almost 10 years, but the same day I began writing the script for this video, it was announced that Bethesda will be releasing the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Anniversary Edition on the same day I intend for this video to be published, on the game's 10th birthday. This new version will include forward compatibility with the Xbox Series X and PS5, and will include new content from the Creation Club, as well as all the DLC. It may well also feature certain technological improvements, although this is unconfirmed at the time of writing, but one hopes. I bought this game three times already, and yet I enjoy Skyrim so much that I need only the smallest excuse to jump back into it. Understandably, some gamers feel it's absurd that Bethesda is once again re-releasing the game, and I can see why they feel this way. Skyrim aside, I have many problems with Bethesda as a company, and I do fear for the future of the Elder Scrolls series, and I'll get to that later. But for now, the promise of fresh content is enough to get me saying... Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Regardless of how you feel about all the re-releases of Skyrim, it does prove that despite being a 10 year old game, gamers are still hooked on it. Now there are other games that aim to keep gamers playing for the long haul. In recent years we've seen the rise of the games as a service genre, which sees games like Destiny 2, Fortnite, Call of Duty Warzone all keeping players hooked by providing fresh content for their respective game for a long time after its release. It's not hard to see why these games keep players on board, they're designed to do so, but what's so impressive about Skyrim's ability to keep gamers' attention is that it was never designed to be a games as a service game. Unlike most of the aforementioned games, Skyrim has no official online multiplayer, so there's no PvP or co-op of any sort, there are no leaderboards or weekly challenges, and there are no loot boxes or microtransactions. 
Now, you could argue that the Creation Club mods are similar to microtransactions, but I would argue that, one, they were introduced years after the game's launch, thus the main game was not designed with them in mind, and two, as someone who despises games that tried to force gamers into buying loot boxes or microtransactions with excessive grind, I do not find that Skyrim does this at all with its Creation Club mods. In fact, I think a casual gamer could play through the game without ever knowing they're there, you literally have to go through the menu to access them, and at no point while playing does the game ever advertise them. God, can you imagine if you killed your first dragon and a message popped up saying, Hey, if you want to learn more Dragon Shouts fast, why not head to the Creation Club page and purchase the Dragon Shouts location map for only 10 bucks? Ugh. What I'm trying to say is that Skyrim as a whole, without engaging in any of the underhanded tactics games as a service titles often employ, has managed to remain constantly relevant in the gaming landscape, which is seriously impressive when you consider how many amazing games have since been released and vie for our attention. As gamers, we have more choice than ever when it comes to video games, and yet so many of us, myself included, keep coming back to this clunky but amazing game released back in 2011. What I want to know is why? How did Skyrim get so under our skin? I think a lot of it has to do with how much freedom the game gives the player. After a relatively short introduction that teaches players the basics, we're then given the freedom to explore a vast open world full of adventure with a character we can shape however we want. Do you want to play as a lone ranger who relies on nothing but his sword and shield to defeat his enemies? That's fine. Others might like to play as a sneaky Khajiit assassin who can pick any lock, uses stealth and archery to defeat opponents, and steals anything that's not nailed down to sell on for easy coin. Fans of magic will delight in learning the arcane arts, and play as a sorcerer who can use devastating spells to overcome foes. Or maybe you'd like to completely ignore the main quest and instead play as a hunter who wanders the wilds, earning gold by hunting game and selling their pelts to traders. It's entirely up to you, and I struggle to think of a way in which you could play Skyrim and not have a good time. This freedom also means that two players could do the same quest but have much different experiences, which also means there's great replay value. My first ever character was basically a knight who went around in heavy armour, tackling challenges head on. This meant that while my character was tough, he was useless when it came to more subtle gameplay features, such as pickpocketing or sneaking. My second character focused entirely on stealth and archery, meaning she wasn't especially tough physically, but could use her abilities to avoid head-on fights by taking enemies out from afar, or just sneak right past them. Then I wondered what a character who relies solely on magic would be like, so that warranted another playthrough. And then I wondered what it would be like to play as peacefully as possible, using speech skills to persuade people rather than my sword. You get the idea, there are so many ways to roleplay in Skyrim, that years after its release, I'd be sat in traffic in my car or lying in bed trying to get to sleep, when suddenly I'd hear Todd Howard whispering in my ear, asking me what it might be like if I played Skyrim as a vampire lord, or as a werewolf, or as Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, one of those might be a mod, but it's still lore friendly in my book. Speaking of mods... Bethesda games are almost synonymous with modding, and there is an almost endless amount of enjoyment to be had with Skyrim thanks to its incredible and dedicated modding community. There is so much extra content to be enjoyed, from new quests, characters, weapons, spells, armour sets, locations, not to mention mods that totally overhaul the way the game plays. Of course, before you even begin your game, you'll want to install the unofficial Skyrim patch, which tackles many of the numerous bugs found in the game that Bethesda could be bothered to fix. Shame on you, Bethesda. And there are a number of Skyrim graphic mods which make the game far prettier. And there are mods that change how quickly you level up, how and when you can access skill perks, and even how characters move and react to the world around them. Now I've dived into the world of mods, I could never go back. And mods are available on pretty much all platforms except for the Switch. Sorry Zelda. <laughs> This in my mind has turned Skyrim into more of a toy than a game, very much like virtual Lego. No, not like that, although given how often it's re-released, I think Todd Howard would be open to a Lego Skyrim game, and I would buy it. What I mean is, when you have a Lego set, you can create the thing that that set is meant to create, but you can also pull the pieces apart and start creating your own thing. This is like Skyrim. You can play and enjoy it the way Bethesda intended, but thanks to mods, you can also pull the game apart and rebuild it in a way that suits you. This is something I think a lot of games as a service titles miss. They try and keep gamers hooked with a steady drip feed of grinding and new content, which oftentimes makes them feel more of a job than a fun pastime. I think giving players more freedom of choice is an excellent way to get them to stick around. Look at Minecraft, it's a game that's often compared to Lego and is almost entirely focused on letting players be creative whilst giving them the tools to make and do whatever they want. That game is still going strong and it also came out the same month as Skyrim. 
In a similar vein, the Forge mode first introduced in Halo 3 allowed players to create their own maps they could share online, and this excellent feature is largely responsible for the game's hugely popular online multiplayer, and it's no surprise it's been included in most Halo games since. Games that make gamers feel empowered are the ones we're most likely to keep playing, not live service games that make us feel like a rat on a wheel. The next point I'm about to make may be more specific to me, but I have a feeling it may also apply to others who have a certain video game they love, so I'm going to explore it. Skyrim is a game I'm extremely familiar with. I know the streets of cities like Whiterun and Solitude as well as I know the street I live on in real life, and I can navigate my way through its world with only the occasional glance at my map. Many of the NPCs feel kind of like old friends, and I always enjoyed greeting Alvor at his forge in Riverwood and crafting him an iron dagger, or bumping into Maik the liar and listening to the daft advice he gives. I sometimes listen to the game's soundtrack when I'm writing, and I still have the map that came with the game framed on my wall. Don't get me wrong, I love diving into new games, but when life is stressful and I just want to chill after a long week, I find it very relaxing to go back and play a game I'm very familiar with, and there are a few games I know as well as Skyrim. I know the game inside out, I know how to beat each quest, defeat each enemy, and where I am anywhere in the map. It's a game that doesn't demand anything of me, I know its rules and how it works, and I can just chill out and enjoy it without feeling any stress or tension. It's nice to just wander the plains of White Run or buy and sell goods in the idyllic village of Riverwood as I enjoy the beautiful soundtrack and ambient sounds. I honestly think you'd see my blood pressure drop and my heart rate slow if you hooked me up to a life support machine as I played. I'm not saying everyone who plays Skyrim loves it this way, but I think most people who enjoy video games have a title that helps them unwind, whether it be Skyrim or Animal Crossing or Zelda or Mario or any game really. Skyrim is well suited to be a game like this given its genre. When the real world is getting too much, it's nice to lose yourself in a vast fantasy land. I think most people have a happy place they like to metaphorically go to to unwind, whether that be a book, TV show, film or video game. But for me it's Skyrim, and I really wouldn't be surprised to hear other people take refuge there as well. There's no way I can say this without sounding patronising to younger viewers, but I was only 18 when the game came out. In the eyes of society I may technically have been an adult, but 10 years later I look back and realise I was little more than a child then. I know that 28 still isn't very old, at least that's what I tell myself as I push 30, but I have so much more experience now than I did then, but also a lot more responsibility. At the danger of looking back with rose tinted glasses, which I almost certainly am, replaying Skyrim takes me back to a time when things seem simpler. I know that for most of this video I have gushed over Skyrim, but as I alluded to in the intro, I'm not at all blind to its shortcomings. In fact, I'd say almost every part of Skyrim has some kind of flaw. Though they're not horrible, even in 2011 the game's graphics weren't what you'd call cutting edge, especially when you consider Uncharted 3 came out the same year. The game's main story is fine, nothing special but enough to carry it, though Skyrim would be pretty far down my list of games I'd recommend for their story alone. The game's combat is perfectly functional but rather shallow and a little clunky, and is a far cry from the sort found in Dark Souls, which also came out the same year. In terms of sound, I think the game is great. The music is perfect and most of the ambient sounds are spot on. The only real issue I have is the amount of characters who are voiced by the same actor. There are some high profile actors used for just one character each, like Christopher Plummer as Angar and Charles Martinet as Parthenox. You may not know Martinet by name, but you know him as the voice of the most iconic character in video game history. It's a me, Mario! Woohoo! However, a lot of voice actors voice a lot of characters in the game. For instance, Stephen Russell voices Bellathor. He also voices all these other characters, and it is noticeable. That's not a criticism of him as an actor. I doubt any voice actor could make so many characters sound distinct. More an oversight by Bethesda, though I appreciate hiring voice actors isn't cheap. In terms of quests, while I find them enjoyable, most of them are pretty cookie cutter, with some exceptions. A lot of them could be boiled down to talk to this person, fight your way through a cave to find the item they want, fight a somewhat tough enemy to get the item, return to quest giver. There are some exceptions to this, particularly when it comes to Daedric quests, but for the most part the quests are pretty similar and lack any real twists or turns in their narrative, which is a shame. You usually find some good loot along the way and of course gain experience, so it never feels like a waste of time, but there's room for improvement. In a similar vein, I will say that the puzzles in the game are just way, way too easy and it makes me feel like everyone in Skyrim is really quite stupid when they seem unable to complete puzzles that a child could figure out. I know Skyrim isn't a puzzle game, but could there not have been just some puzzles that caused me to stop and think for a moment? Last but not least, I want to talk about bugs. 
Bethesda games are synonymous with bugs, and for some bizarre reason, a lot of people, including game critics, give the company a pass on this. Some even go as far as to say that bugs are just another feature of a Bethesda game, implying that the game wouldn't be as good were they not there. I've never heard a good rationale for this, and I do not understand why Bethesda seems to be allowed to release bug-ridden games for full price when other companies get torn to shreds for it. As great as the community is at modding Bethesda games, the company knows that they can release a buggy game and then rely on the gamers to fix it. If Bethesda can't be bothered to release a stable game, why should we pay full price for it? Skyrim has been re-released so many times, and yet not once has Bethesda thought it wise to actually fix core issues found within the game. This is something Bethesda seriously needs to address going forwards, and it should have been addressed 10 years ago. I hope that the absolute disaster that was Fallout 76 has taught them a lesson. All of this just works. Given how much I've raved over Skyrim, you'd be forgiven for assuming I'm already on board the hype train for The Elder Scrolls 6. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm not very interested to learn what the next instalment in the series is going to be like. But in the last few years, I've become increasingly pessimistic about the future of the franchise and about the future of Bethesda in general. The fact is, Bethesda is a very different company to the one we knew in 2011, and the quality of their products has been in decline ever since. In 2015, we saw the release of the long-awaited Fallout 4. I'm not for a second going to say that it's a bad game, I spent plenty of happy hours with it, but I think most of us would agree it's not nearly as enjoyable as either Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas. Later we saw the release of The Elder Scrolls Blades, a spin-off mobile game which received lukewarm reviews at best and has been criticised for its use of microtransactions and grind. Then we had the absolute debacle that was Fallout 76. Many people have made very long videos about the release of that game, and if you're at all into video games then you probably already know the score, but that game really was the final nail in the coffin for my opinion of Bethesda. I understand that video game development is very, very hard, and from what little I know of the process it makes me wonder how good video games get made at all. That said, the higher ups at Bethesda should be absolutely ashamed of the release of Fallout 76, and I struggle to think of any game that had such an awful launch. I really don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that just about everything that could have gone wrong with that game did. This video isn't about Fallout 76, so I won't go into it all here, but if you want to learn more then I have put a link to two videos in the description. One is of the internet historian's The Fall of 76 video, and the other is of Joseph Anderson's almost three hour long video detailing the numerous glitches he encountered. I really, really hate to say it, but as far as I can see, the management of Bethesda has fallen to the dark side and is fast becoming on par with EA. I no longer think that as a company, Bethesda's goal is to create quality games. I think it desperately wants to strike gold with a game that features microtransactions and enjoys the same sort of success as Fortnite or Hearthstone. We saw this with the addition of paid mods in Skyrim and Fallout 4, and we've seen it with the microtransactions in Fallout 76. With all this in mind, I am very concerned about the future of The Elder Scrolls, and I will be extremely happy but also extremely surprised if, when The Elder Scrolls 6 is finally released, it doesn't have some kind of microtransactions or loot boxes. I really, really hope I improve wrong on my pessimism for the next Elder Scrolls, but I have a horrible feeling I'll be right. I think the best indication of what we can expect from The Elder Scrolls 6 will be how Bethesda's next game, Starfield, turns out. The success of games like 2018's God of War, The Last of Us and Breath of the Wild have all proven that there is still a huge market for single player games and I really hope Skyrim doesn't turn out to be the last of its kind in Bethesda's catalogue of games. So in a video dedicated to explaining why I and others adore Skyrim so much, I have just spent a good chunk of time criticising it, but I think that's important. Firstly, if you love something, that doesn't mean you're blind to its flaws, and you shouldn't be afraid to point them out. I care about this game, I want future releases to be as good as possible, and secondly, I also want to make it clear that just because this game holds a special place for me, that doesn't mean I'll pretend it doesn't have any shortcomings or think it's above criticism. Despite its flaws, Skyrim is an incredible game, and I think it deserves the longevity it's enjoyed over the past decade. 10 years is a really long time in the world of video games, and I love how Skyrim is still hugely popular and many great content creators still stream it regularly. I think it's safe to say that we aren't going to have to wait another 10 years for The Elder Scrolls 6, and the release of that game will no doubt mark the end of Skyrim's numerous re-releases, but I don't think for a minute that will stop plenty of gamers, myself included, from booting it up now and then and reliving some old memories. I think it's fair to say that Skyrim is now part of an elite club that includes the likes of Half-Life, San Andreas, Ocarina of Time and the original Doom. 
It's the game that people will point to in the future as a special moment in gaming, and in decades to come we'll see other games compared to it. Of course, as the years pass by, its grip on pop culture will lessen, but I don't think for a minute it will be forgotten. In another 10 years, as I push 40 and November approaches, I have no reason to believe I won't feel Skyrim calling to me, and I will return.